opening, I would like to welcome you to tonight's ninth and last educational webinar sponsored by the Coalition Peace Initiative and co-sponsored by 11 other organizations. My name is Don Tao, and I'll serve as your host for tonight's program, whose topic is China is not United States enemy. As you know, we have organized a series of nine webinars to promote peace between the United States and China. This series of webinars revolve around the three topics of Chinese American experience in the United States, modern Chinese history, relationship between the United States and China. We chose these three topics because we believe that the most important question facing the world today is whether our world is moving toward war or peace. And the key to answering that question is the relationship between the United States and China. To understand the current United States-China relationship, we need to understand the historical relationship between US and China and the evolution of that relationship and how the world has changed during the last 50 years or so. To understand the historical development of US-China relationship, we also need to understand how China was treated by the foreign powers, including the United States. Therefore, we need to discuss modern Chinese history, in particular, starting with the 19th century. How China is treated by the United States is very much related to how Chinese Americans are treated in the United States. That's why we also need to discuss the experience of Chinese Americans in the United States. We hope that these educational webinars would help people understand that the current US policy of demonization of China is not based on facts, but mostly on fabrications. And that such fabricated demonization of China is not good for Americans and also not good for all the people of the world because it will move the world toward war instead of peace. The consequences will be that critical funding will be allocated to the military and for wars instead of using those valuable resources to solve many critical global problems. Furthermore, the most serious consequence is that it could lead to nuclear war that could destroy the world as we know it. Tonight's webinar is really the crux of this webinar series. It builds on the previous eight webinars to discuss why China is not the enemy of the United States. Thank you. That's the introduction. Now we will start tonight's program, which I, as I said, is the culmination of this webinar series. We have a very packed program tonight with two speakers, Sheila Zhao and KJ No. Together, they have a total time of 35 minutes for their two talks. They will, we will have a 15 minute Q&A, then I'll wrap up the whole webinar program with a five minute summary and also three announcements. Now I introduce our two speakers. Sheila Sao is a researcher, data scientist, and community organizer based in Los Angeles. A second generation Chinese American who was raised in San Francisco, California and studied in University of California, Irvine. She's a tireless advocate for communities of color and the co-founder of the organization Pivot to Peace. KJ No is a South Korean scholar, educator, and journalist focusing on the political economy and geopolitics of the Asia Pacific. He writes regularly for several publications, including Counterpunch, Asia Times, and LA Progressive. He also does frequent commentary and analysis of various news programs, including The Critical Hour, Political Misfits, KPFA Flashpoints, and Breakthrough News. Sheila and KJ, the floor is yours. I believe you two agree that KJ will speak first, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. Now the floor is yours. You can share the screen if you want. Thank you. Hey everybody, so I'm delighted to be here and I thank the Coalition Peace Initiative for inviting me. I wanted to give a quick overview of uh, the China 
quote unquote threat and uh, a, and say a little bit of why this is completely misguided and mistaken. So uh, clearly in the elite discourse uh, and among the political class, the US is saying that China is a threat. It has said, it has labeled China a revisionist power, which is just a, a fancy word for official enemy in the national security strategy, in the national defense strategy. Kurt Campbell, who is the Asia SAR for the Biden administration says, the era of engagement has ended. Eli Ratner, who is seconded to the Defense Department on China says, everything must be oriented around China. And of course, all the think tanks and discourse elites are talking about the China threat. The longer telegram says that China is a threat and that uh, the US should consider uh, uh, regime change. And of course, Mark Miley recently said to the Chinese military, he said, if we're going to attack, I'm going to call you. He didn't say we're not going to attack you. He didn't say it's absurd that we're going to attack you. He said, if we're going to attack, I'm going to call you. So clearly, China is a threat for the ruling class. Uh, the, the threat inflation has many different dimensions. They see it as a threat to the rules-based international order. It is an existential threat. It is a bio-warfare threat. It's a nuclear threat. It's a genocidal threat. And of course, China is responsible for global warming and threatens planetary ecocide. Of course, the elites say to themselves that China is not a threat. They know that it is not a threat. Uh, the military sources say that China has no first strike capacity. Uh, and all this language of imminent danger pacing threat uh, is not true. However, the public discourse is about existential threats. Uh, most recently, they've spoken about China as being a nuclear threat. Now, remember the US has 5,500 nuclear warheads, 3,750 on hair trigger. China has possibly 200, at maximum 300, none of which are on hair trigger alert. And China does not have a first strike, first strike uh, policy. But this is the kind of public threat inflation that we are seeing. Uh, there's also this uh, talk about Xinjiang, uh, that China is some kind of genocidal threat. And all of this, Donto and many, many others have shown that is completely and totally fraudulent. But the threat inflation goes on. Um, there's also the threat of quote unquote digital authoritarianism. Uh, Donald Trump famously said that China was raping the US. Hal Brands in a recent Atlantic article said that China will attack soon and we should prepare to attack uh, preemptively. <laughs> and therefore, uh, the US must combat, take down China. Uh, Biden and Trump had said, we have to get uh, tougher on China. And they actually had a contest between the two of them saying that uh, the other one was too weak on China. Now, all of this goes back to the 1990s defense planning guidance document, which is the neocon plan for global domination. This becomes uh, the uh, Bush doctrine, and then it becomes the Obama doctrine, and then it becomes the Trump doctrine, and then it becomes the Biden doctrine, which continues to this day, and it's a continual escalation. These ideas themselves are built on the yellow pel peril trope, which is a colonial war trope. It's built on the red, care, red scare trope, which is the Cold War trope. And of course, Hillary Clinton said famously, I don't want my grandchildren to grow up in a world dominated by China. Kyron Skinner said, it's the first time that we have had a non-Western competitor. But all of this threat inflation falls apart uh, there was a recent article in Palladium magazine, which was very well written, and they state the obvious that no great power in history has risen as peacefully as China. China has not been to war since 1979, and even that was just in defense of an ally uh, which was being colonized by Vietnam. And 
um, if China were a member of NATO, it would be sanctioned for not spending enough on its military. So um, it has had no kinetic conflict since 1979. It wants peaceful reunification with Taiwan has offered a one country, two systems approach. It wants peaceful resolution of the South China Sea disputes, it wants to overcome COVID and help other countries do the same. It has an exemplary policy towards minorities, in particular in Xinjiang. Uh, it has gives preferential treatment. There is no genocide, no slave labor. Uh, and minorities in China have preferential treatment and representation at the highest levels of government. This is written into the constitution. Also assists Africa with development, with no strings attached, unlike the World Bank or the IMF. It's not a threat through espionage, uh, and it's not even an ideological threat. <clears throat> Certainly, it's not a biological threat. This is a racist trope, and it taps back into older tropes that Asians and Chinese are dirty, deceitful, dangerous, depraved. Um, it's not a threat in the South China Sea. Disputes over bodies of water are very, very common. This is a dispute between Switzerland, Germany, and Austria over Lake Constance. And, uh, uh, without, uh, if the U.S. were to go in there with gunboats, then that would be a completely different story. But disputes over water are not uncommon. So there's so many lies to refute, and it's a little bit like playing uh, whack-a-mole, but essentially we're looking at the elite version of QAnon. That is to say, the elites are constantly telling us lies and we are constantly trying to back, bat them down. Uh, some of these lies, Chinese human rights abuses, concentration camp, stolen our jobs, uh, uh, et cetera, destroying the planet, threat to the world. So, you know, let's say this for the record, China is a, not a threat in the South China Sea. Uh, it's not a threat to Taiwan. It wants peaceful reunification with Taiwan. And the Taiwanese themselves have not declared uh, independence because they can't. It's in their constitution that they, that they see themselves uh, as uh, one China. Uh, China is not a threat to your freedom, certainly is not a nuclear threat. As I said, it does not have hair trigger alert. It has no first use policy, and it has a minuscule fraction of the number of warheads that the United States has. Uh, certainly not a bio warfare threat. In fact, it's done everything humanly possible to protect itself and the countries around it, including given a uh, giving the, uh, the information about the genetic sequence, which it uploaded on January 5th, not January 11th, but January 5th to GenBank. That's how quickly it worked. And once we had that information, it was an open book exam for everybody else. There's no reason or excuse for the kind of uh, casualties that we're seeing all around the world, especially in the developed West. It's not a threat to your lifestyle. And it's certainly not a threat to Hillary Clinton's grandchildren. But we have to ask, why is China considered a threat? And it's considered an economic threat because it has the biggest economy in the world. And pardon my graphic images, but China was developing its economy rather than bombing countries. And therefore, it grew big. And size matters in the economic sphere. And this is one thing that the West and the US finds intolerable. A multipolarity itself is a threat. Uh, it creates a different pole of development. It creates choice in a multipolar world. That is, there are opportunities to develop in a non-Western, a non-capitalist way. 
And it also poses an ideological threat, the ideological threat of a good example, such as Cuba, Haiti, Venezuela, North Korea, China, et cetera, that you can become wealthy and have a developed society without becoming a Western capitalist vassal state. <laughs> So essentially, uh, the US sees it as a threat to the world system, and China is breaking out of the global system of extractive subservience uh, to the global north. Uh, from 1960, about 150, 160 trillions was extracted from the global south. And the wealth of the West, including the wealth of the quote unquote social democratic countries, is dependent on extraordinary extraction from the global south. Only four countries have become developed, uh, Taiwan and Korea, and they were given special exemptions, two offshore havens and one or two city-states. All the others have remained subservient to the US-led global system. <laughs> and China did not stay in its junior subservient position and this is why it has been reformulated into an all domain threat. <clears throat> uh, it also is a threat to US geostrategic hegemony. Uh, often the US will mention China's A2AD anti-access area defense capacity. This simply means China's capacity to defend itself. And the fact that China can defend itself in its literal coastal waters is considered a threat to the US, in particular a threat to the US hegemony. <laughs> so uh, as seen as a threat, the US is escalating on all fronts to contain, roll back, take down China. It's creating uh, uh, alliances. Uh, it's engaging in hybrid warfare, lawfare, regime change, information warfare, as well as preparations for kinetic war. And of course, there is a constant and ongoing attempt to destroy China's development and economy. Uh, so this is just a short list of some of the warfare or uh, hybrid warfare that the US is engaging against China. None of this so far has been dialed down. It's ongoing. Sometimes different elements are accentuated at different moments but it's a kind of all domain, uh, full spectrum warfare. <clears throat> of course, the key thing we can note is the encirclement of China with 400 bases, a specific plan to take China down through uh, bl blockading its sea routes where 77% of its fossil fuels go through and $5.3 trillion worth of its trade travels to. This would bring China's economy down in an instant. So it's trying to block China's advances in technology, it's surrounding its periphery, it's spurring unrest in various uh, regions, it's weaponizing Taiwan, it's lobbying allies, allies and building coalitions against it. It wants to contain China. <clears throat> now, Chinese Americans here are at risk. This is why we see the random attacks on Asians. When you have this kind of global policy demonization that will trickle down into retail violence on the streets. You cannot prepare to attack people over here without having people over here, Asian people over here, become collateral damage. Okay. Now, there's a, a small subset of Asians that are trying to manage this oppression by distinguishing themselves from the Chinese or the Chinese Communist Party. They say, uh, you know, we're not Chinese, we're uh, Chinese Americans. Uh, but in the end, this is a false distinction. It's a false sense of safety. Uh, it's similar to what the Judenrat attempt to do uh, during World War II against Jewish oppression. Uh, ultimately, it's a full scale, uh, everybody, uh, you know, there are no innocents here. Uh, and I encourage people, if you're not convinced about this, to watch a film called The Garden of the Fincy Contenus, which tells the story of an elite or aristocratic Jewish family that believe that they are so cultured, so wealthy, and so elite that they will be safe. 
<clears throat> Why does uh, the US think China is a threat? We can go over the history, the history of racism, the history of the Chinese in the US, the history of US-China relations. But to put it in a nutshell, China is a threat to capitalism, imperialism, and let's name it for what it is, white supremacy. China's system is a challenge to those who believe that poverty and suffering are intractable, that the poor should and always will be with us. It's a challenge to those who believe in a system that engenders poverty and suffering for profit. And it, it, it's a challenge to those who believe the third world and people of color of those countries should be kept in submission. China is an enemy of the ruling imperial elite class. It is a challenge to the capitalist elite profit driven system. It's a threat to the global order, the rules-based international order, the Western imposed caste system on the world. It's a threat to white Western Atlantic supremacy. It's a challenge to those who think development has to be Western or Western led. It's a challenge to those who would keep people of color in their place. And of course, it is an enemy of those who see China as an enemy. So this is the state of affairs. Uh, once again, uh, once uh, subjugated people arise, this creates a dilemma for the oppressing class. It's very similar to the idea of policing where anything that challenges a sense of superiority and total domination is seen as a lethal threat and treated accordingly. The, the example is the Korean War, which was considered to be a police action. And the US has policed the world in a similar way that it polices its internal colonies. Uh, this is just one example. I'm from Korea. These were the Puerto League massacres. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people killed in weeks for the simple crime of wanting an independent country that was socialist. We saw the same thing in Indonesia. We saw massive wars in Vietnam and all over the world. So once again, I'll tell you that those who tell you absurdities are preparing you for atrocities. Uh, the US is a threat to the rest of the world. It's also a threat to itself. There's much work that we need to do inside the US itself to bring it back up to uh, a developing world status. And we have to work for peace together. I'll finish with the words of Asata Shakur, who says, only a fool lets somebody else tell them who their enemy is. Never let your enemies choose your enemies for you. China is not an enemy. China is not a threat. And I would like to finish with the uh, immortal words of Gil Scott Heron, who exhorted all of us to work for peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, KJ, uh, for giving us many examples, specific examples of why China is not United States enemy. Sheila, now it's your, your turn. Um, okay, the floor is yours, Sheila. Yeah, well, thank you so much, everyone, for having me um, and KJ for that great presentation. Uh, it is an honor to be able to speak at this final webinar of this nine part series. This series, in my opinion, is super, super important because it really lays the groundwork for the real task at hand, which KJ, of course, primed us on, which is to demand that the US end its aggression towards China that war with China bears no interest to uh, normal working class people here in the US, normal working class people in China, nor anywhere else in the world. And we've seen how catastrophic wars, colonialism, racist scapegoating has been used to aid the agenda for profit, expansion, and global hegemony at uh, all at the expense of our humanity. And we're watching this agenda uh, for war being built bit by bit right in front of our eyes in, in the very different ways of hybrid warfare that KJ outlined earlier. And the mainstream media, of course, paints this picture of China that is very, very far from the truth, right? 
And I think that this webinar series opens a space in which people can engage in a fair and open and balanced discourse about China without the political interference or sensa sen sensationalization or demonization of China. The fact of the matter is anti-China sentiment is echoed in all chambers of mainstream culture, including everything from academia to news to pop culture. I mean, it pervades our society. And what we're up against is a highly perfected form of propaganda war that begins as a well-funded marketing campaign that again pervades our institutions of learning, the news we consume, the social media we engage in, pop culture, where a particular portrayal, no matter how distorted, becomes quote unquote, the truth. And any discourse outside of the narrow par parameters is to be condemned, right? This leaves little to no room for genuine debate. And we see this in the case of Xinjiang, of Hong Kong, Tibet, and of course, most recently, Taiwan. And we are up against a situation where any ounce of doubt about the mainstream narrative is to be condemned. And isn't that ironic for a country that boasts about freedom of speech? The US military is encircling China with a chain of air bases and military ports, where more than 400,000 US military personnel are now pre-positioned in the region. And the coming air-sea battles are being actively prepared. Most Americans today have seen this country engage in war for our entire lives. And that is certainly true for my life. Uh, my entire life, this country has been in war. Uh, draining our tax dollars on these endless wars, destabilizing and destroying other countries. And we just saw the US after a decades long war be defeated by a minor force like the Taliban in Afghanistan. So what sense does it make for the US to believe that confrontation with the People's Republic of China, a country nearly a fifth of the world's population with, the, with stellar popular support, with strong military is a good idea. Of course, it's a terrible idea. And to most Americans, no matter their opinion of China, the country, understand that aggression and confrontation with China is a catastrophic mistake. While the powers that be are actively manufacturing consent for potential confrontation, it is our job to continue to grow support for the position of peace. There is no other choice. And many of us who have been doing this work for years now, including the folks in Pivot to Peace, um, you know, since we founded Pivot to Peace a year and a half ago, I can tell you that the efforts of our collective peace movement, which includes China is not our enemy, um, Coalition Peace Initiative, and so many other organizations um, is gaining momentum um, and has moved the discussion on China, even in the mainstream. Of course, there's a lot of work to be done, right? This week, the meeting between Biden and Xi, President Xi, was a signal that there is an avenue for the lessening of tensions and a pledge for greater cooperation. And while there is yet to be any evidence of the U.S. backing down, this nonetheless indicates a turn away from the cavalier all out aggression that we've seen in the previous administration and of course the previous months. And our message of peace and more importantly, the message against this new cold war is ever growing. Not to mention the unexpected joint declaration between the US and China on cooperation on the climate issues at COP26. As the climate disasters become increasingly catastrophic and threatening to life on earth, global cooperation is absolutely necessary. And only time will tell what this will achieve given that the US and mainstream media still consistently and falsely point the finger at China as the largest source of emissions globally without any historical context. And this is despite the fact that China has invested double the amount of money on renewable energy than the US between 2010 and 2019, and that the US's per capita emissions is 2.7 times higher than that of China. So the joint statement, while we consider it a step towards progress, we still have such a long way to go. And so we must speak beyond our immediate peace movement and we must move the millions uh, the people of this country to actively oppose the idea of war with China. The demonization campaign against China 
that has been rolled out in the past few years is primarily designed to mute or overcome the threat of public opposition to the drive toward war and confrontation. And to accomplish the goal, sections of the US ruling class and the intelligence services with the corporate owned media playing their part have developed a longer, sophisticated and multifaceted campaign to teach the people of this country to both hate and fear China. And this goes back to this hybrid warfare that KJ spoke about earlier. And those of us who oppose this coming war need to wage equally an effective multifaceted truth-telling campaign to win over the American people. Not only to tell the truth and provide a counter narrative to counter the demonizing lies about China, but to focus public attention on the real purpose of the demonization campaign which is to prepare the public ultimately to accept the rationale for a new military conflict. Our campaign must be able to convince people that China is in fact not our enemy and that we stand to gain so much more through cooperation with China. And quite frankly, aren't we sick of, of our country being at war? And we must be able to speak directly to the people of the United States in a way that pulls them away from accepting this dominant anti-China narrative. One thing that's important to consider is that demonization is like any caricature. It's like challenging a stereotype. And the reason we're directing ourselves and must direct ourselves towards the people of the US is that outside of China's own military prowess, the attitudes and consciousness of the American people is the only other possible break on the rush towards war with China. We must gain popular support on our position of peace. There are different pillars of the imperial demonization campaign, many of which we have already covered in the course of this series. And the purpose of this webinar series is to arm ourselves with the facts to tell the truth about the reality of this war drive against China. And we have to both specifically address the lies or the caricatures that are dominant themes within the different pillars, and at the same time, unmask the fact that each pillar of the campaign is in fact nothing more than a pretext to win the population over towards the need to adopt confrontation, a confrontational stance towards China. Um, and I, I have six points of these pillars, which KJ already sort of covered, but I'll just go through them again, which is one, that Hong Kong has had its freedom stripped from it, right, this, this is a part of the US narrative. Two, that the people of Western China, specifically in the Uyghur population in Xinjiang are the victims of genocide and forced assimilation. Three, that the people of Tibet have been denied their rights to be independent and to safeguard their culture and religion. Four, that Taiwan is really an independent country and its independence must be safeguarded by foreign assistance, including foreign armaments. Five, that China is a totalitarian police state without any semblance of democracy. Six, that China is an imperial power bullying its neighbors, seizing disputed territories and waters and engaged in colonial type exploitation in Africa and elsewhere. So one of the challenges in the truth telling efforts of people inside the United States who seek to challenge these falsehoods in any of these six areas is that those who present even factual arguments that counter the dominant narrative are labeled as apologists or agents of the People's Republic of China. US propaganda positions these six pillars by presenting China as a violator of human rights in the broadest sense of the term, and that the US is the champion of these threatened rights. In other words, the US is motivated by a noble cause and China is just pure evil. The real irony about this is that today we are caught between two clear examples of how the US really views human rights. Ahmad Arbery, an unarmed black man was shot and killed by racists while he was on a run. And this along with the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor sparked the anti-racist uprisings of 2020. Arbery's killers are on trial for, for his murder as we speak, but the defense team has a very clear racist agenda to ensure that there is no justice served for Ahmad Arbery. At the same time, the justice system is stacked in favor of Kyle Rittenhouse, a white right-winged vigilante who traveled to Kenosha during the anti-racist protests after the shooting of Jacob Blake. And 
Rittenhouse shot and killed two people, injuring a third. So the US has no place to police any other country about human rights when something as simple as justice for senseless racist killings cannot be served, at least not easily. So these glaring contradictions may seem obvious to those of us who are here today, but we do have to take note of the major issue that we're facing. If it were simply, if it were just easy to convince people that US imperialism is creating pretextual arguments to mask and camouflage its predatory objectives, we would have popular support. But this camouflage, because it's being reinforced day in and day out by corporate media, is considered to be the truth by tens of millions of people in the US. So even though it's difficult and it's hard, and even though it takes courage to go against the stream, we have no other option but to engage in a fact-based truth-telling campaign. And we don't need to convince everyone that China is the greatest or that China doesn't have its own internal contradictions, but we do need to expose that the demonization campaign and propaganda is based on cherry picking certain facts or just made up lies. And so in order to wage this campaign, again, we need a strong factual based presentation that is persuasive and is conducted with a strong sense of objective faculty. Um, we need to be able to tell the truth about China and all of its social advances, refuting the lies and the demonization and at the same time, make it quite clear that we are representatives of the people here in the United States and not the voice of the Chinese embassy. And when we started Pivot to Peace, we felt that we were almost alone in the United States doing this work. But in the last 18 months, what's become clearer is that more and more organizations are taking up this work. And the more we go against the stream, the more we have the courage to speak up, the more people are inspired to speak out against this war agenda. And our hope is that this grows into an ever larger movement, and it is growing. Ultimately, the principal need is to convince millions of people that the military industrial complex and the war machine and the politicians who represent them are creating false excuses to bring the country and the world to the brink of catastrophic war. And we have to unmask the war drive for what it really is. According to the Brown University's Watson Institute, the US has spent $6.7 trillion in the so-called war on terror since 2001. Now the US is preparing to spend an even larger sum of money in preparation for confrontation with China. At the same time, one out of every two people in the US live either in near poverty or in poverty. 50% of all personal bankruptcies are due to in individuals' inability to pay medical bills. And 8 million families are facing imminent eviction or foreclosures from their homes because of unpaid debts. This is the reality we live in. This is the richest country in the world. We must make the argument that the security of the people in the United States, especially working class and poor people, means to spend trillions of dollars to meet human needs rather than to prepare for a war with China. We will not buy the excuse that there's no money for healthcare, education, housing, jobs. There is money. It's just being plundered for, for more war. And the imperialist demonization campaign, of course it may seem all powerful because it is. And the media is marching in lockstep. But their weakness is that the demonization campaign is literally premised on lies. The war planners cannot actually tell the people the truth about what this is all about. And if people learn the truth, if we are effective in our work, if we are committed to making this not a small effort with a small segment of the population, but a massive, massive effort reaching the millions, we believe that we can create a powerful movement for peace. I know that this is possible because history has shown us that this is possible. The truth is on our side. And when we are in the motions of building and organizing, it is hard to see just how far we've moved the needle. And in my humble opinion, I think that our small but mighty and ever growing movement is making gains, as I talked about before. And we should indeed celebrate this. But this also means that we can and must push ahead, convincing our fellow Americans that China is not our enemy, that we wanna live in a world of global cooperation for the sake of the planet and for the sake of our future. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Um, especially 
for reminding us your six points of contention or accusation that the United States has made against China. Before I continue, I want to say that um, if you have questions that you want to ask, make sure you use the question and answer box. I noticed there are a lot of comments on the chat box, but until just now, actually, I did not see any question, although I see a question now. So I want to give you the opportunity to put in your question in the question and answer box. Um, now I would like to open the floor for question and answer. Um, since the question just popped up, maybe I can start out with one question. Uh, KJ, you, you, are, you are a journalist and you've been involved a lot with media and mass media. So one question I want to ask you is that, um, you know, the United States and in general, the Western mass media has been basically in sync with the United States policy uh, toward China, especially the United States fabricated accusations against China. So how does the Western mass media work so closely and uh, in close steps, basically echoing whatever the United States government is saying? Uh, can you comment on that, uh, KJ, from your experience with the mass media? Yes, it's a pretty um, sophisticated uh, uh, system that is set up. The first thing we have to understand is that, quote unquote, Western democracies are uh, all about manufacturing consent. And one of the key asymmetrical strengths that they have is in their advertising and PR systems, their advertising and PR ecology. So this work starts uh, initially in think tanks, which serve as kind of like shadow governments, then it's doled out to the elite uh, journals and some of the elite magazines. And then there's a system of trickle down and as well as you know the organizations like AP and Reuters that then circulated en masse. But once something, uh, once uh, you know, a meme or a story or a propaganda offensive is initiated, then you see rapid, rapid coordination. It's a very, very complex and sophisticated system. And as I said, we call it information warfare because it literally is a form of warfare. And the terrain of combat is your brain. They're occupying and overtaking your capacity to think uh, uh, independently. And so this is why individual efforts, as well as, you know, telling the truth and sharing good information is so important. Your brain, your mind itself is uh, a battlefield and it's uh, incumbent on all of us to do what we can to struggle against this indoctrination. There are key, key few tactics that they use. One is intense emotionality, mass repetition, multiple sources that come at you, uh, and then playing on uh, you know, very, very uh, emotionally manipulative uh, techniques. So uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I noticed there's one question in the question and answer box. Actually, it's not a question so much, it's more like a comment. Um, maybe uh, KJ and uh, Sheila, maybe you can take a look at that. It's a uh, comment by Jiro uh, Belsky. It's a very long comment. Maybe you can take a look at it and see if you want to comment on it. And I just noticed another question just pop up. The contradiction by Jeffrey Ho, the contradiction and agreement about Xinjiang genocide has manifested in disagreements between journalists within peace groups. There are journalists or researchers that feel strongly about atrocities toward Uyghur Muslims. What would be the perspective that at least one to have strong concerns? Uh, KJ or Sheila, do you want to comment on that? Uh, this is a question from Jeffrey Ho. Um, maybe I, I give you a chance to take a look at it and see if you want to answer that in, in some capacity? Um, I'll take uh, Jeffrey's uh, question on the Xinjiang genocide. Okay. Um, simply, uh, you know, I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, there is no there there. I've been researching this for years. Uh, I've been looking at it from all angles. There are experts 
who have looked at it from all angles. And I'm talking about the State Department lawyers themselves. They've said there is no genocide. The International Criminal Court had reams of information thrown at it. The International Criminal Court, which has universal jurisdiction to open investigations, regardless of the strength of uh, an allegation, chose not to. The Organization for Islamic Cooperation said, we commend China's treatment of its Islamic uh, uh, Islamic population. And this is this makes perfect sense. China has no history of oppressing Islam inside its own borders. In fact, it developed Islam indigenously. There are four indigenous schools of Islam that are Chinese. They're Sufi schools that are all Chinese. And, um, uh, and of course, we can look at the bare facts, the fact that um, the, the population has doubled in 40 years. It has increased 25% in the last eight years from 2010 to 2018, uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, 150 million people visit Xinjiang on a regular basis. Uh, none of them have come back with any uh, stories of uh, mass incarceration or concentration camps. Now that said, is there some kind of program of de-radicalization going on? That is true. And that is because the US since the late 90s has been weaponizing Xinjiang against the Chinese. They're essentially a funding terrorists to wage a separatist war. And the Chinese have taken a very, very global approach of re-education, de-radicalization, which seems to have worked and comes out, uh, it looks much more effective and certainly less violating of human rights than anything that you see in Western Europe, including what you see in the UK and France. Uh, I'm sure Don may have some thoughts about this. I'm sure Sheila has yeah. thoughts about this. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you, KJ. Uh, yeah, Jeffrey, regarding your question, I would like to make a comment on uh, a lot of the Western journalists who have made all these uh, uh, reports, uh, newspaper articles about Xinjiang, actually most of them have never visited Xinjiang. But however, we know quite a few people, not only Chinese, but Westerners, Americans, Canadians, British, Australians, French people who have visited Xinjiang as recent as the last year or the last two years. And some of them have visited them many times during the last 10 years. And they come back with these reports, which are completely different from a lot of these Western journalists who have never visited Xinjiang. So therefore you say, oh, there are two different camps, two different types of opinion on, on what they write about the Xinjiang. You have to look at their experience and uh, where did they get the information? I think if you look at that, and then you come to the conclusion that KJ mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, and I, I also mentioned it several weeks ago in my article, in my talk on Xinjiang. And I also want to mention one thing. Uh, several weeks ago, Julie, uh, Julie Tang also gave a very good talk on Hong Kong. Right, Julie gave us a, uh, a website which shows you the funding that this organization provided to a lot of organizations in Hong Kong. As a matter of fact, in that same reference, not only can you find uh, National Endowment for Democracy, okay, National Endowment, -E -E, National Endowment for Democracy, NED, okay. Not only that they are providing funding for Hong Kong, you can also find in the same website, funding for the, through the United government, the N NED has provided to various organizations in Xinjiang, okay. Um, Does anybody want to uh, make any comment on a couple questions, a couple comments made by the Gerald Belsky? Uh, Gerald, uh, respect to your second question, let me make a comment on that, okay? You asked, um, the Sheila Institute has advocated the idea that the way to end the dynamic to war 
is peace through development. So that both sides benefit through development as cooperation of the Bell and Road Initiative. And could that cooperation be the real United States interest? Yes, in my opinion, that real cooperation is, could be in the United States interest. But however, United States is not taking that position because United States doesn't want to make China stronger. They look at it as a competitor, but not only as a competitor, but as a competitor, which I'll mention again later, uh, they're following a policy, foreign, foreign policy of uh, Tanya Harding policy. Instead of competing against each other in a peaceful way and in a, a normal way, they are attacking the opponent uh, unjustly. Okay, um, we, have t uh, we have time for a couple more comments or questions. Um, one of the comments that I saw in the chat box, I think it's by Madison Tang. She said that through the peace movement, we actually have made some progress recently. And that is, we have uh, successfully uh, kept the Ego Act from being voted on. The Ego Act is a $7.5 billion for military spending. So that's one of the successes that the peace movement has accomplished recently. I don't know, Madison, do you want to make any more comment on that? I'm sure, thank you. Uh, I We have basically been educating folks um, in our coalition, including with Pivot to Peace, um, and I am at Code Pink, the China is not our enemy campaign on these very large packages of legislation being pushed through Congress in bipartisan ways um, that include, they're just littered with 300, 400 mentions of China um, and the threat of China to justify all kinds of spending, but primarily we're focused on the military spending and the dangers of that, including nuclear um, weapons. So a lot of people haven't been aware of these bills and we've just been trying to educate so that folks know that's where their tax money is going. And the Eagle Act is one of those bills, HR 3524. Um, there could be many reasons, including disagreements within the house that it hasn't been um, put to a vote. Um, but I think one of the reasons is that uh, people are more aware and there's been some active um, advocating against the bill. We had some, we had a rally at Nancy Pelosi's house, at Senator Markey's house in Boston. We have a couple petitions on the bill. Um, but right now we are also focused on the Innovation and Competition Act, which was, the Eagle was meant to be a companion bill to it. Um, there's, if you search for all the bills right now, there, there are so many focused on China. Um, but one good thing is that the Innovation and Competition Act was supposed to be folded into the NDAA in the Pentagon budget. Um, just today, there was word of it, and uh, they are not going to be doing that. So it's going to be uh, argued and amended, I think, before it potentially passes. Hopefully it won't. Um, okay. Yeah, and I also wanted to pose a question I added into the chat. Um, to either of the panelists, um, let's see. In what ways are the U.S.'s claims about maintaining a free and open Indo-Pacific disingenuous? Can you repeat that question again, Madison? You yeah, a little bit what, fast. In what ways are the U.S.'s claims about maintaining a free and open Indo-Pacific disingenuous? That's a great question, Madison. The first uh, thing I'll note is the term Indo-Pacific. That's a neologism that's created by the United States. We used to call it the Asia Pacific, but this is uh, an attempt to corral India into the quad to uh, combat China. But the whole notion of a free and open Indo-Pacific is absurd because as I said before, uh, $5.3 trillion worth of goods are shipped through the South China Sea, most of it headed towards China. So there is absolutely no reason why, the, why China would seek to impede any of this uh, shipping or any of this trade. That said, uh, the US is a naval power 
and the imperial west has always controlled the world through its navies and so therefore what they mean by a free and open indo-pacific means uh, uh an ocean or indo-pacific which is free of china's capacity to defend itself free of china's capacity to interfere with the us and the western imperialist control of naval sea lanes yes Thank you. That's a very good answer. Let me just add a comment to that. You know, the United States, one of the United States accusations is that there's a freedom of uh, navigation in South China Sea. There's a problem of freedom of navigation. There has never been a freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. All of that is all bogus, all make up on the United States. They always, always say that, oh, China is uh, filling up the islands and uh, uh, to, to, to block the freedom of navigation. Come on, if you own an island, international laws allows you to fill some of the land around the island, okay? We have, uh, we have seen that happen all over the world and the United States has never complained about that, okay? So the freedom of navigation is completely bogus issue. Okay, in light of the so this time we already past nine o'clock. I just want to, uh, first of all, I want to thank Sheila and KJ for wrapping up this webinar program and pointing out many, give, giving many specific examples of why China is not the enemy of the United States. I want to take a few minutes to summarize this series of webinars. As we have emphasized repeatedly, the most important question facing the world today is whether the world's moving toward war or peace. And the answer, key to the answer to that question is the relationship between the United States and China. There are many critical global problems that the world is facing. It's absolutely critical that the world's two most important and most powerful countries work cooperatively to solve these problems. Okay, that could lead to a win-win situation for all the people of the world. As our speakers tonight pointed out that China is not the enemy of the United States. As a matter of fact, if China were the United States enemy, China would have many military bases surrounding the United States. China does not. But the United States does have many military bases all around China. If China were the enemy of the United States, China would have alliances with countries around and near the United States. China does not. But the United States does have many alliances, including military alliances with various countries around and near China. If China were the United States enemy, China would be fabricating accusations against the United States in order to psychologically prepare its citizens when conflicts and wars break out between the two countries. China has not done that. But the United States has repeatedly done that, as we have discussed throughout this whole webinar series. Series. If China were the United States enemy, China would be boycotting United States companies and arresting United States business leaders on trumped up charges. China has not done that, but the United States has done that. If China were the United States enemy, China would try to destabilize the United States and try to encourage secession activities within the United States. China has not done that, but the United States has repeatedly done that. If China were the United States enemy, China would provide encouragement, financial support, and perhaps even military support to those organizations or parts of the United States who have differences of opinion for the United States government. China has not done that, but the United States has repeatedly done that. In summary, China has not taken any of the actions which an enemy of the United States would likely be taking. However, on the other hand, the United States is repeatedly taking all of those actions. That's why in this webinar program, we have repeatedly emphasized that the United States government's demonization of China is essentially based on fabrications and not based on facts. 
Of course, the United States and China, we also need to compete against each other. As a matter of fact, we believe that it's healthy to a competition between the United States and China, but that competition should be based on decency and fair play. As we said earlier, the United States foreign policy should not adopt a Tanya Harding like foreign policy to unfairly attack its major competitor. On the other hand, it's equally important to recognize that the United States policy and actions all reflect the United States government belief that China is the United States enemy. The United States must look within itself instead of blaming others for its problems. This is the most important attitude that needs to be changed. If that's not changed, we will not be able to solve our internal problems, our United States internal problems. And we will not be able to help the world to solve many critical global problems. And we will move the world closer to war instead of peace. Before we end this webinar program, I just want to make three announcements. First one, the replay links for all the webinars can be found in the Coalition Peace Initiative website, whose link has been posted in the chat box. And that information, the link was also sent this morning to all the registrants of this webinar program, totaling around 300. Of course, tonight's webinar, the replay link will not be available until early next week. Also this morning, when we sent out the replay links for the eighth webinar, we also included a very simple survey to complete online. The survey is to be done completely online and will take no more than five minutes to complete. The survey will provide information to us on what future programs which may be of interest to you and how we can improve our program. Please complete the survey online before the deadline on Saturday November 20th. Finally, if you believe that the activities of the Coalition Peace Initiative are worthwhile, please sign the Coalition Peace Initiative petition. The link has also been posted in the chat box tonight, and it was also included in this morning's email or sent to all of you. I'm happy to announce that since our previous webinar just last Wednesday, on November 10, we have received another 62 new signatures to the petition. Finally, I want to thank all the speakers of this whole webinar series. I especially want to express my appreciation for all the participants, especially those who had attended multiple webinars. Let's all work together harder for peace in order that our children and grandchildren with a livable world to grow up in. Thank you and good night.